Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Walt Tribley, and I'm the president here at Sheridan College, and it's my honor to welcome you here tonight on a snowy, cold night in Sheridan, Wyoming, and a school night nonetheless, and to those of you who are joining us on our live streaming around the world, wherever you are. We're in for a treat tonight. Thank you uh, also very much to our Thickman Lecture Endowment for its generous contributions to the faculty lecture series here at Sheridan College. The Sheridan College Faculty Lecture Series is designed to bring the scholarly expertise of Sheridan College faculty to the community. It has been funded by contributions to the College Foundation from Muriel and Seymour Thickman since 2007. We would not be able to have this extraordinary opportunity without that funding and the generosity of the Thickmans and the support of our Sheridan College Foundation. I'd like to thank you for attending and supporting our events here at Sheridan College. Afterwards, you'll have a chance to interact with our presenter, our speaker tonight, so, and have, share some refreshments. Tonight, the general uh, title that I will use is Creativity and, Ca uh, excuse me, create, Creativity and Captivity. And I'm reminded of our general education curriculum. Yes, those GEs that even STEM majors like me took and the value of those. Along the way, I learned about Maslow's hierarchy of need, that I need to have safety and security before I can think about calculus or other things, you know, reach that point of fulfillment or enlightenment. And I'm also reminded of the different types of domains that we are all made up in our human condition. We have our psychomotor domain, how our brain and our bodies connect. We have our affective domain, our courage, our character, our integrity. And we have our cognitive domain, how we think. In the cognitive domain, we think of creating things as the highest level of human thought. Now tonight, there's going to be a juxtaposition of humanity being in the most inhumane and unstable and unsafe condition, creating beautiful works of humanity. And it will take a scholar to bring us there and make sense of it. And that scholar is Dr. Rachel Bergman. Dr. Bergman's research focuses on the music of Victor Ullmann, an Austro-Hungarian composer who was killed in the Holocaust. Dr. Bergman's publications include a book chapter in Singing and Signs, New Semiotic Explorations of Opera in the Oxford University Press, published in 2020, and articles and reviews in the Opera Journal and Gamut, Online Journal of Music Theory Society of the Mid, of Mid Atlantic. She has presented papers and lectures, recitals at numerous conferences regionally, nationally, and internationally. Prior to coming to Sheridan College, Dr. Bergman serves as, served as a tenured associate professor of music theory and director of graduate studies for the School of Music at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. She earned a PhD in music theory from Yale University and a BA in music and mathematics from Skidmore College. Please give a warm welcome to our scholar tonight, Dr. Rachel Bergman. Thank you, Dr. Tribley, for that wonderful welcome. Um, and you know what? If you guys want to move closer, there's not a ton of us here, but I appreciate you all being here, and I also want to say welcome to those of you who are tuning in from home as well. Um, this is a topic near and dear to me. I completed my dissertation on the music of Victor Ullmann way back in 2001, so a long, long time ago, and I have been studying and promoting his music ever since. So I'm thrilled to be here sharing this with you this evening. I'm going to start by just outlining um, Ullmann's life. He's likely not a familiar name to many of you, um, so I'm going to place him in a historical context. Then we're going to spend some time learning about Theresienstadt, which is the concentration camp where he spent the final two years of his life. He wrote a lot of music while he was there, so it wasn't one of the 
typical concentration camps, so we'll learn a little bit about that. And then finally, we'll get to the opera, and um, I'll kind of walk you through some of the important themes and connections to the work being written in the midst of World War II. So here he is, Victor Ullmann, obviously a pre-war photo, pre-World War II photo. Um, and I thought it would be helpful to give you a sense of where, what part of the country we're talking about. So Austro-Hungary um, is now mostly the, the Czech Republic. If you can see the, the um, places that I've highlighted with the purple square, those are the, the main places that I'm going to be highlighting tonight and the, uh, the places where he spent a lot of his career. Uh, not so much in, in Silesia, Teshin, which is on the, the far right or the east of the map. That's where he was born. He grew up in Vienna and uh, German is his primary language and then he spent quite a bit of time in Prague as well. And those are gonna be themes that come back in the opera, the themes of sort of the German tradition and the Czech tradition. So here's the first part uh, of his life. As I said, he grew up in Vienna. He studied music, he took piano lessons, he studied music theory. Um, and he then, uh, enlisted in the military, volunteered in 1916, spent two years there after he finished his gymnasium, so kind of his high school years, went into the army, was promoted to lieutenant in 1918. Um, this will also be something we'll, we'll uh, revisit later. And uh, then he returned to Vienna after his military service and um, this was kind of a big deal. He was accepted into Arnold Schoenberg's composition seminar. Now Schoenberg, for those of you who are music folks in the audience, you may know that name. Hopefully you know that name. You will study him if you are, if you are a music student. Uh, he was largely responsible for abandoning tonality. So when you think of classical music, you think of Mozart and Beethoven and, and music that's very pleasing to the ear and very easy to listen to. And Schoenberg was uh, largely responsible, I mean, it was a succession, but, but Schoenberg is given credit for breaking away from that and writing music that um, was qu uh, quite a bit more dissonant, uh, a little bit more difficult to process and listen to. Um, but anyway, so Schoenberg was, was kind of a big deal in his time, and he's still a big deal today. He's a composer that, that every music student in every university music program will, will study at some point. Uh, so Ullmann is here with, uh, in Vienna studying with Schoenberg, uh, and he was made a founding member of the Society for Private Musical Performances. That was also sort of a very prominent avant-garde group where um, new works were being performed. So he was kind of at the cutting edge of the music scene uh, at this time. He met and fell in love with a fellow composition student in, in uh, Schoenberg's seminar, and in 1919, he married her and they moved to Prague. So um, he then spent most of his 20s in Prague. Here again, he was in the uh, circles of very prominent musicians. Zemlinski is another one of them. Zemlinski was an Austrian composer, conductor, and teacher. And Ullmann conducted under Zemlinski at the New German Theater in Prague. And here he developed a very comprehensive grasp of both um, Czech and German musical repertoire. Um, again, connected with the leading musical figures, intellectual artistic figures, and witnessed a number of performances of new works. Um, Berg's Wozzeck is uh, notable among them. In uh, 1927, he went to Ausig, which is um, now in the Czech Republic, and he was appointed a conductor of an opera house there, so opera is with him for a lot of his career. And uh, among the works he conducted there were Wagner and Mozart. So uh, lots of exposure to lots of music. He wrote a set of variations on a theme by Schoenberg as sort of a, an ode to his teacher, and he wrote the work in 1925, but in 1929, uh, this work was performed at an international festival, and so that's really what put 
Oman on the map internationally. It brought him international attention. Uh, you'll note that there's actually a break in activity from 1929 to my next slide where you see uh, 1931. So in 1929, Oman sort of had a, a crisis of conscience. He, um, he left music for a period. He was struggling to sort of figure out his place uh, his place in music, his place in the world. He did a lot of reading, he did a lot of soul searching, and um, I think part of it was that he did not feel like um, this move from, from away from tonality was the solution. He wanted his music to be accessible and appreciated. So, um, so the, anyway, so that was a period of, of sort of uh, questioning and, and wandering a little bit. So he worked full time in a, a bookstore in Stuttgart and, and did that for two years. Uh, you'll see that I've put in red the events of World War II just to, to sort of highlight how that impacted his, his life. Um, he did ultimately return to music in uh, 1933. He moved back to Prague. That coincides with the rise of, of the Nazis in power in Germany. and. Uh, he went back to his musical endeavors. So he worked as a freelance musician, uh, very similar to me, what musicians have to do today, a lot of different, different tasks. He composed, he conducted, he wrote articles, he lectured, he was an educator. Um, and then at the same time, you'll note that he went back to school. So here he is, 37 years old, and he decided to return to studies at the Prague Conservatory under Alois Haba, and that, he, Ahaba is a Czech composer. So again, you're seeing this mix of German and Czech and Austrian. Um, Haba was known for writing quarter tone music, which I can tell you about another time. <laughs> so Ullmann does have a quarter, one quarter tone work in his, in his repertoire, but again, he, he then sort of moved away from that. Um, I guess the next important date that that I will focus on is his deportation to Theresienstadt. And that happened in uh, September of 1942. And you'll see here he composed many new works there. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And, uh, and then finally in October 16th, 1944, he was transported to Auschwitz. And Auschwitz was the largest of the German Nazi extermination camps where over 1.1 million men, women, and children lost their lives. And here's a map just to show you where Theresienstadt and Auschwitz are. Theresienstadt is just about 45 minutes north of Prague. And I'm going to show you a video clip um, just to kind of set the stage for Theresienstadt. Crazy, make believe world.
And here are some photos of Theresienstadt, the entrance. So only the most privileged Jews, and I should put quotes around that word privileged, were sent to this model ghetto. Those deported included Czech, German, and Austrian elderly war veterans who were either highly decorated or had been severely wounded in World War II, Jewish partners in mixed marriages, half Jews, Jews in eminent positions such as a prime minister or mayor, and prominent artists, musicians, writers, and academicians. To the surprise of those deported, though, Theresienstadt was a far cry from a safe haven in which to wait out the war. One survivor recalls her shock upon arriving in Theresienstadt. Quote, where was the senior citizen's home, the residence of which they had spoken to us? Where were the clean houses where everybody would have their own well-furnished room? Through open doors, we saw shapes in rags lying on the floor or on wooden frames. Groups of misery were led to pick up food. Each carried his own little container in his hand." End quote. Peter Fischel, a 15-year-old who perished in Auschwitz, describes his time in Theresienstadt as follows. We got used to standing in line at 7 o'clock in the morning, at 12 noon, and again at 7 o'clock in the evening. We stood in a long queue with a plate in our hand, into which they ladled a little warmed up water with a salty or a coffee flavor, or else they gave us a few potatoes. We got used to undeserved slaps, blows, and executions. We got accustomed to seeing people die in their own excrement, to seeing piled up coffins full of corpses, to seeing the sick amid dirt and filth, and to seeing the helpless doctors. We got used to it, that from time to time, 1,000 unhappy souls would come here, and that from time to time, another 1,000 unhappy souls would go away. Here's one more image of Theresienstadt. Despite the overcrowding, the lack of food, infectious diseases, and regular transports to Auschwitz, artists were permitted and eventually encouraged to pursue their cultural endeavors. While activities such as lectures, concerts, cabarets, plays, and poetry readings began informally and were initially illegal, by 1942, the Freizeit Gestaltung, which was the, the administration of free time activities in the camp, had not only been well established, but was sanctioned by the SS command. The Nazis, believing that these activities would prevent the prisoners from causing trouble, were confident that all the Jews would soon be destroyed anyway, so there was no harm in indulging them with a bit of leisure time until then. Moreover, they realized that they could use the cultural activity in Theresienstadt for propaganda purposes, showing the outside world that, that life in the camps wasn't really so terrible. Consequently, professionally recognized musicians and artists were able to maintain a status somewhat akin to that of pre-war society. And in fact, the uh, International Red Cross came and visited the camp in uh, summer of 1944, just before the end of the war. And they noted that, yeah, they, they staged a soccer match and they painted curtains on windows that you know, had no curtains. And um, it was a big success, so they, they, fooled, they fooled everyone. Uh, it should be noted that culture played a very important role in the lives of Central European intelligentsia. And because of this, the inmates of Theresienstadt were highly motivated and determined to maintain some semblance of their earlier cultural involvements. Theresienstadt scholar Joe Zakaris explains that in pre-war days, quote, it was not a pastime, entertainment, social obligation, or fad to attend concerts and operatic performances. It was rather a way of life, an integral part as important as basic human needs, such as food and drink, end quote. I think that's a little bit hard for us to understand when we're, we're definitely not in that kind of a culture. This mentality helps to explain the fervor with which the Theresienstadt prisoners participated in and attended and supported cultural activities in the camp. Thus, at a time when the rest of Europe and all occupied territories were completely cut off from any Jewish activity, 
Theresienstadt served, in essence, as a sort of Jewish cultural mecca, where in addition to the production of new works, works by com composers banned by the Third Reich, such as Mendelssohn, Mahler, and Schoenberg, also flourished. Ullmann was officially assigned to the Freizeit Gestaltung as a music critic and organizer of music rehearsals and practice allotments for the pianists. And yes, there was a piano in Theresienstadt. He, uh, in, in the former role, he produced 27 music reviews that vividly document the musical activities of Theresienstadt. Ullmann also founded and directed the Studio for New Music, presenting programs by Schoenberg, Mahler, Haba, Zemlinski, so you'll recognize many of those names from the biography, uh, as well as works of young Theresienstadt composers. In addition, Ullmann gave artistic direction and participated as pianist in concerts of the Collegium Musicum, which was an ensemble that focused on earlier music. Most importantly, Ullmann was exempt from any manual labor and thus had time to pursue his own musical endeavors. Furthermore, since he had served in the Austrian army during World War I, he received somewhat preferential treatment and was fairly safe from the regular transports to the gas chambers. Thus, Ullmann was more prolific in Theresienstadt than he had been before the war, composing three piano sonatas, a string quartet, a melodrama for speaker and piano or orchestra, an overture to Don Quixote, several dozen leader songs, and choruses written on German, French, Hebrew, and Yiddish texts. And of course, Der Kaiser von Atlantis, the subject of this evening's talk. Ullmann explained that, quote, I have written in Theresienstadt a fair amount of new music, mainly to meet the needs and wishes of conductors, stage directors, pianists, and singers, and thereby of the recreation administration of the ghetto. To compile a list would seem as superfluous as to point out that piano playing was impossible in Theresienstadt as long as there were no instruments. Likewise uninteresting for future generations should be the painful scarcity of music manuscript paper. But it must be emphasized that Theresienstadt has served to enhance, not impede, my musical activities, that by no means did we sit weeping on the banks of the waters of Babylon, and that our endeavor with respect to art was commensurate with our will to live, end quote. I think that's, that's a pretty remarkable statement. Okay, now we're gonna go on to the opera. Der Kaiser von Atlantis oder der Tod dankt ab, so there's a kind of a subtitle, The Emperor of Atlantis or Death Abdicates, was a collaboration between Ullmann and fellow inmate Peter Keen, a young painter and poet who wrote the libretto on the backs of transport lists. The story is highly allegorical and depicts a world where life and death no longer have any meaning. Emperor Overall has declared war for his own glorification, but death refuses to cooperate and will not allow anyone to die. The ensuing chaos causes the emperor to realize his mistake and to sacrifice himself, ultimately, for both the restoration of death's cooperation and for the good of humanity. The opera is scored for seven singers and 13 instrumentalists, so it's, it's really a uh, chamber opera. It's small. It's less than an hour long. Uh, it was composed with specific musicians in mind. And the unusual orchestration, which includes an alto saxophone, a banjo, and harpsichord, <clears throat> uh, reflects the resources that were available. So uh, you can see in this next slide that I've got an excerpt from the prologue. So this is the very opening of the opera, and it introduces all the characters. Okay, and I'm gonna play this for you in just a moment. Um, most of the characters are associated with a particular instrument and or a particular musical idea. And so as you listen to this excerpt, I would like you to pay particular attention to three things that are gonna be important for the remainder of, of um, this lecture this evening and for what we see at the end of the opera as well. Number one, there's a hello, hello motive. A motive is like a musical idea and it recurs throughout the opera as a unifying device. You'll hear it at the very beginning, you'll hear it at another spot, um, and you'll hear it for a few of the other examples. So the hello, hello motive is one of the things I want you to try to listen for. 
Second is the drummer girl. Okay, so she's introduced um, early on after the emperor. She functions as an extension of the emperor, and um, the emperor, in turn, is sort of a very thinly disguised uh, Hitler. Uh, and there, she's represented very appropriately by a snare drum, okay? So you'll hear that. It has very strong martial associations. That's the second thing I want you to listen for. Third thing, Harlequin. So the character of Harlequin is, um, as stated in the prologue, he knows how to laugh through his tears. So he's kind of a comedic character. Uh, he symbolizes life, and he's represented less by a specific instrument, though you'll hear him first introduced by the clarinet. Um, but his music is always the same, and that's a sort of playful jazz-like theme that always accompanies his character. Uh, this theme is very short. It's a, an abbreviated form in this prologue. So I'm also going to play a little bit of the next uh, piece for you, which is the prelude, uh, and that features Harlequin's theme. So you'll be able to hear that a little bit better. So those three things, hello, hello, drummer girl, and the Harlequin theme. Es treten auf Kaiser Uberall von Atlantis in eigener Person, die man schon seit Jahren nicht gesehen hat, denn er ist in seinem Riesenpalast eingeschlossen, ganz allein, um besser regieren zu können. Der Trommler, eine nicht ganz wirkliche Erscheinung, wie das Radio. Der Lautsprecher, den man nicht sieht, nur hört. Ein Soldat. Und ein Mädchen. Der Tod als ein abgedankter Soldat. Und Harlequin, der unter Tränen lachen kann. Das ist das Leben. Das erste Bild spielt irgendwo. Tod und Harlekin sitzen im Ausgedinge. Das Leben, das nicht mehr lachen und das Sterben, das nicht mehr weinen kann in einer Welt, die verlernt hat, am Leben sich zu freuen und des Todes zu sterben. Der Tod, den das geschäftige Getriebe, die Hast, die maschinelle Entwicklung des modernen Lebens gekränkt und beleidigt hat, zerbricht sein Schwert, um der Menschheit eine Lehre zu erteilen und beschließt, von nun an niemand mehr sterben zu lassen. Hallo, hallo! Wir beginnen! And then Harlequin's theme. I have two examples on the same slide. Okay, hopefully you have those. Okay. In addition to introducing the characters, the prologue paints a rather bleak picture of the world in which the opera takes place, a world strikingly similar to Theresienstadt. Here, quote, the living can no longer laugh and the dying can no longer cry in a world that can neither enjoy life nor embrace death, end quote. Throughout the opera, Ullmann draws heavily on themes of death portrayed in both the German and Czech musical literature. 
The opening hello, hello motive, which you already heard at least four times or so, uh, if you were listening carefully in the prologue, uh, <clears throat> recurs throughout the opera, as I mentioned, as a unifying device. It's a quotation of the theme of the death theme from Czech composer Josef Suk's Asriel Symphony. Asriel is the angel of death who takes away the souls of the dead. And Suk composed the Asriel Symphony in response to the deaths of his teacher and father-in-law, Antonin Dvorak, another very prominent composer, um, and his own wife, so Suk's own wife, Dvorak's daughter, who was just 27 years old when she died. The symphony was subsequently performed on occasions of national mourning throughout the first Czechoslovak Republic, and the musically knowledgeable Theresienstadt audience would have recognized the reference in this context. So I'm going to play a couple of examples of that hello, hello motive, um, which is not obviously called hello, hello in, in, the, Souk, in the Souk symphony, but it's the death motive. Um, this performance is by the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra with Belo Lavek conducting. So here's the first example. Brass, hopefully. Ullmann does change the, um, the pitches in that motive, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. And here's one more example from the Asriel Symphony. And then Ullmann's version, I'll just plunk it out on the piano for you one more time. So here's Ullmann's version. So I don't know if you can hear it, but Ullmann makes it a little bit more dissonant. He uses uh, a, a dissonant interval, They're, those are called tritones. Um, so the music folks out there will know hopefully what I'm talking about. But essentially he's, he's taking the original motive, you can still recognize it because of the shape um, and the rhythm, but he is making it a little bit more dissonant, a little bit more jarring, um, which I think is significant considering uh, what, where, where he is and um, what he's trying to convey. Oh, and in case you didn't get it in your ears enough, I was going to show it one more time. We're good with that, I think. <laughs> We're going to move along. Um, okay. One of the most daring musical references is Ullmann's inclusion of the German national anthem, Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles, uh, which was originally from a Haydn string quartet. So again, ties to German tradition, um, Austrian tradition. And this is incorporated into the scene where the drummer girl announces the emperor's declaration of war. And this is a very pompous declaration. She's kind of making fun of the emperor in a way, where Ullmann is certainly making fun because he's saying, here's the emperor, and he's king of this and ruler of this, and he's so great. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very exaggerated and, and pompous proclamation of the emperor's greatness. Um, also note that there's a play on Uber Alles, because Uber All is is um, the emperor's name in German, right? Overall, uber alles. So Ullmann is clearly mocking his captors. Uh, he also distorts. Again, he, he doesn't take his original material and just plop it in there. He alters it a little bit. And I'm gonna show you, um, before we listen to the original and then Ullmann's version, I'm just gonna play it on the piano again for you the original version and then how Oman changes it. And again, he's making it more dissonant, a little bit more distorted. Um, think of going through one of those, um, you know, those funny mirrors that distort things when you walk through, like the, those funny houses, what are they called? How, yeah. 
Anyway, here's the original. It's in a major key. Here's Ullmann's version. So hopefully you can hear how he's made it a little darker, a little um, creepier, because he's changed some of those intervals. And those of you, again, who know music, you will, might recognize that as the Phrygian mode. It's got the flat scale degree two. The rest of you don't worry about that. <laughs> and so here's the original. Um, well, here's a version of, of the German national anthem. <laughs> Actually, going to watch a clip of the drummer girl scene where she is going to sing that music. Um, and this is from a German production, and I, I found it on, on YouTube. It's called OKTV OK Ludwig Schaffen, and Rosario Chavez is the, um, the drummer girl. She's a, it's a mezzo soprano role. Uh, you'll also hear that hello, hello motive again, which um, is remember that death theme. So here we go. Okay, I'm giving away the next quotation. So um, this is the final quotation that I'm going to share with you this evening. Ullmann concludes Der Kaiser von Atlantis with an adaptation of the Lutheran chorale Ein Feste Berg ist unser Gott, which is literally a mighty fortress is our God. So note that that title, first of all, is um, a mighty fortress, easily applies to Theresienstadt which is quite literally a mighty fortress. It is perhaps more than mere coincidence that Mendelssohn, another composer of Jewish heritage banned by the Nazis, used this very same chorale in the finale of his Reformation Symphony, a work that Ullmann would have been familiar with. So I want to play for you um, the, the, uh, 
and Festeberg Chorale with its translation, and then we'll hear the Mendelssohn, and then we'll hear Ullmann. So here's this. that part. And then here's the Mendelssohn uh, example from his Reformation Symphony, the finale. that also because I think you'll hear that Ullmann's setting is, is very close to the, that opening of Mendelssohn. Um, so here's Der Kaiser finale. You will hear this, um, this, to, this um, Lutheran chorale, but also I um, wanted to just say a few words about this text and some other things that are going on here. So Ullmann sets the music of of this Lutheran chorale to the words, Komm tot du unser werter Gast, come death our honored guest, imploring humanity not to treat death lightly. Recall that I introduced the um, characters at the beginning. I asked you to pay particular attention to those three things, right? Hello, hello, drummer girl, and Harlequin, the life theme. Um, you are gonna hear Harlequin's theme here as I play this chorale setting for you. Um, and again, remember, Harlequin is representing life. You're gonna hear it played in a solo violin line, and then later you're going to hear it sung in unison to all the voices singing it together, to the words, thou shalt not take uh, death's great name in vain. So Ullmann seems to be asserting that there be as much dignity in death as there is in life. Uh, at the very end of the finale, over the final chord of the opera, you're going to hear that snare drum come back. I'm kind of giving it away. If, this, if I had a chance to <laughs> ask you to listen for it and see if you'll, you'll hear it at the end. Um, it's somewhat unexpected in this beautiful, calm uh, finale. So why is it there? It may represent that the emperor's final farewell as he's left alone and that it is the emperor's final farewell as he's left alone and defeated. Um, but recall that it was also present, the snare drum was also present at the opening of the opera and Ullmann may be urging us to remember the horror of war so that the fate of humanity is never again in jeopardy. So let's listen to this finale. You're gonna hear the chorale tune. You're gonna hear the Harlequin theme of life. And then at the very end, you're gonna hear that snare drum come back.
So as we've seen, Ullmann's musical language is rich with quotations from diverse sources within the German Czech musical tradition. References that are fraught with potent meaning for both Ullmann and his Theresienstadt audience. In building upon this rich musical tradition, Ullmann saw himself as part of a larger continuous musical heritage. This music transcends the confines in which it was written, and even without comprehending all of the allusions, Der Kaiser von Atlantis is both powerful and moving. In the fall of 1944, the opera was being rehearsed for a performance in Theresienstadt, but the performance never took place due to Nazi intervention. Most of the artists involved were included in the mass transports to Auschwitz in October 1944. It was not until over 30 years later that the opera was performed. The premiere took place in Amsterdam in December 1975 and has since been followed by performances in Europe, Israel, Canada, and the United States. In 1995, Der Kaiser von Atlantis was staged in Theresienstadt more than 50 years after its intended performance. Joe Zakaris, in his book, Music in Terezin, insightfully concludes that, quote, it is practically impossible for an outsider to comprehend the complexities and significance of an imprisonment in a concentration camp. It is even more difficult to understand how such living conditions influence the sensitive soul of an artist, end quote. But we do know that in some sense, Theresienstadt provided Ullmann with a certain freedom from material necessities. Before the war, he had continually struggled to earn a living. But once in Theresienstadt, he could devote the majority of his time and energy to his creative endeavors. Yet we must also acknowledge that Theresienstadt was no ordinary place. Perhaps music, above all else, helped Ullmann, as well as others, maintain a semblance of dignity and served as spiritual resistance against the dehumanizing conditions surrounding him. Thank you. So uh, again, uh, Jake, if you turn the lights up, we have time for some questions uh, and discussions with Dr. Bergman. I do ask that you use the microphone so our friends online can hear you and also for the recording. So what questions do we have for Dr. Bergman tonight? <laughs> All right, right here. Please introduce yourself if you feel that would be appropriate. Hi, I'm Robert Cerny. I teach music here. Would you tell us how the scores got from Theresienstadt to being published a number of years later. How did that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Ullmann actually left his scores behind with a friend, another inmate in Theresienstadt, um, who then passed them on to a third person who survived uh, the war and uh, took them, he actually took them to the, um, the Gortianum in, in Dornach, which was a place that had meaning to, to Ullmann. So that's, that's how they got out. I guess Ullmann had the foresight to know like he saw people <laughs> leaving and not coming back, so um, so he did leave those scores behind. Yeah, that's a great question. Other questions? Jake, something from someone at home? Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, Keith, thank you. Hi, I'm Keith Law, and I teach history here. As deeply immersed as uh, as he was in German culture, pan-German culture. Um, did he write much about sort of the cleavage he experienced, the separation uh, from that by virtue of what was happening to him? I missed that word about the what that he experienced? Um, the, the, the sort of the cleavage he was experiencing, oh. the, the, the separation from the German, pan-German culture that had sort of, uh, that he had come up in and absorbed so much. I'm just curious about the, the cognitive dissonance I guess you'd say that. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. He, um, so did he write about it like in, in a journal, like in actual text writing or musical? <laughs> yeah, so, so he was, I think, much more tied to that German tradition than Czech. Again, like, you know, German was his first language and he always, I think, felt like a little bit of an outsider in the Czech world. Um, and actually in the camp, it's really interesting because 
he was, for a long time, his music wasn't performed in the camp because of his, his German connections, right? Which would make sense. So he, and he also uh, didn't have a very strong Jewish identity until he got to the camp. So his, uh, both of his parents were Jewish. His father converted to Christianity to advance in, in the um, army in World War I. Um, and Ullman was brought up as a Catholic. So this was the case for well, many of the, um, you know, Jews that they didn't identify as Jews, they identified as Germans. Um, so it was only in Theresienstadt that he turned to sort of those Jewish roots and he started exploring some Jewish texts in, his, in some of his music. He said a, a piece to uh, a, a Jewish theme and um, that was an influence, I think, of the other Theresienstadt composers who were of Jewish, uh, kind of more, who had stronger Jewish identities. Um, but the German, yeah, I mean, separating himself sort of from the Nazis and that, that German tradition, um, I mean, I guess insofar as he's, he's, you know, making his musical stand against them in these ways that I've shown, right, with uh, making fun of them that way. But he still, I think, felt very strong ties to, to Bach and Mahler. I mean, there's this whole tradition that he wasn't ready to, to throw away, I don't think. So, yeah. We have some online questions, Jake? Sure, yeah, I'll use the mic to read it out. You can type it very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, this one does come from our viewers from afar. Uh, the dissonance of his music seems influenced by Schoenberg's free atonality period. Did Ullmann utilize any of Schoenberg's serial techniques either in Der Kaiser or other works that he wrote? Ooh, I am very grateful for that question because I am, that, this is my world, I can talk all night about this. <laughs> so yes, um, Oman did write a serial um, movement within his string quartet. Uh, it's actually such a cool piece. I, if I had more time, I would play so much more music for you. But the string quartet um, slow movement, it's a largo and it's written, using the 12-tone technique, but in a very tonal way, so a lot closer to Berg's use of 12-tone than, than Schoenberg's. So he still has very tonal harmonies, and it's um, sort of akin to the, the Berg Violin Concerto, for those of you who might be familiar with that piece. So that was about it. He didn't, um, again, he, he really, I think, felt more closely tied to tonality, wasn't ready to to throw it away entirely, but you'll just get, you'll get some, you know, dissonant intervals and unusual harmonies that, that you'll hear that make him very much a modernist, but 12 tone was not his world. Uh, that's not where he landed. So he, yeah. I'm looking at Jake like you asked the question, but. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Bergman this evening? Well, Dr. Bergman, thank you so much for honoring us. Thank here you. Let's thank Dr. Bergman again.